<laughs> if you want to take your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 7 as we start, we will be in 1 Peter chapter 2 eventually, which should not come as a shock. We'll get there. <laughs> So, I want to start off with something uh, just to get you thinking. Here's a, here's a reminder of what we've been talking about for a little, quite a while. There's three things, three specific things, uh, some lessons to remember. And the first is this, you must fear your God. Does this sound familiar? It should. Right, I was making a joke the other day when uh, I had some pastors ask me, what would your people remember about you? They'll probably remember three words. Fear your God. Fear your God. That's all he says. Fear your God. Well, you have to remember your God, and you have to keep an eternal perspective. All three of those things must be together in your Christian walk. And as we look on this and we talk about honor today, honor comes and is held by these three things. They will never go away from, a, from the life of a Christian. Now, here's, a, here's something sad, because we're going to eventually, for the most part, we're going to be talking about the body of Christ today, which is what Peter talks about uh, as we talk a little bit about our soldiers. But speaking of honor, we're going to define it because we don't define it very well anymore. But here's, the, here, here's a, a sad portion that I heard over the last two months when I talked with a bunch of uh, pastors in my travels. And here's a sad statement that really upsets me. My church won't allow me to preach more than 30 minutes because they'll get mad and leave. You know how sad that is? As a body, as a believer, as a brother or sister in Christ, for you to put a time limit on, on God and his working is not honorable. Okay, it is not honorable. Now, it doesn't mean there won't be 30-minute messages from somebody else, uh, <clears throat> but, <laughs> but they're there. But the whole point is, if God speaks, maybe we should just listen. And if we're reading, maybe we should just pay attention as it goes. Because from my perspective, honor is the greatest characteristic that a, a man or a woman of God could ever display. And yes, there is love and there are many great other characteristics and attributes, but honor encompasses all of these things. And we talk about this just from a human perspective. Honor is perhaps one of the greatest things that we can teach and pass on to one another. Again, coming from a, from a cop's home, honor was at the top of the list because either you do your job and people recognize the job that is done or you're recognized as a terrible officer and that is your reputation. Honor stands out. Our military, speaking of our military, honor stands at the top, or at least it should. See, each branch has its own set of core values that each member is expected to follow. And I told you before in a previous sermon that uh, this, is, this should be in every household, it should be with every man, that you have a core set of values that you pass on and that you hold to. But there is a, this core set of values when you join. You are expected to uphold. There is not an option. It is not an argument. It is not a debate. It is, these are the values. You will uphold all of these. Now, we realize that not everybody holds to that type of statement, and I will say the same thing for the Christian body, so don't, don't throw on the judgmental glasses and say, hey, everybody's going to do this perfectly. We, there are people who struggle, and we struggle. But the expectation is that you represent those values in all your life, the same as with the Christian walk. When God saves you, there is an expectation that you will uphold his values. So for our Air Force, our Air Force their, their values are integrity first, service before self, excellence in all that you do. Integrity and honor have a lot to go together. They walk hand in hand. For the Army... Remember what they are? Son? <laughs> he's, he's quiet. 
We'll blame it on the head injury. <laughs> Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage. The Navy and the Marines have the same three, honor, courage, commitment. The Coast Guard, honor, respect, devotion to duty. There's one theme that goes continual. It's honor with selfless service. See, values are not just something that you believe in. They become your character, which is why character matters. As the Army says, Army values are not just what we do. They are who we are. As the Marines explain, a Marine's character is defined by the Corps' values. I'm going to challenge you today to think about what your values are. I know what the Word of God says, are they your values? Because they need to be, but we need to be reminded of them frequently in order to actually live in them. See, most of the services include honor as one of their core values. For the value of honor requires that each individual Marine to demonstrate the ultimate standard of ethical and moral conduct. Or conduct. That is correct. Honor <laughs> needs Morality. I told you before that we as a nation, is that any time a nation does not remember is a nation that is lost, and right now we are lost. Not everybody. God always keeps a remnant. But if I were to tell you that the church knows where they're going as a whole, I would be lying as well. Because it requires God's ethic and moral standard, its honor. But it also requires an uncompromising personal integrity. For the Marines, it says, we expect that of Marines because they expect it of themselves. An honorable Marine would never do anything to solely the reputation of the Corps. Do we have that even that philosophy with Christ? We would never want to solely the name of our Savior? See, for the Navy, the value of honor also requires much of the same thing. Honesty, truthfulness, integrity, and accountability. Coast Guard also identifies honor as a core value and defines honor much the same way as the other two sea services. And according to the Coast Guard, honor is uncompromising ethical conduct and moral behavior. It is a phrase that I absolutely love. Uncompromising ethical conduct and moral behavior. It is being loyal and accountable. And for the Army, the value of honor means living up to the Army values of respect, duty, loyalty, Selfless service, integrity, and personal courage. What I want you to grab a hold of today is that honor is there because it is with your God. Honor is uncompromising. But that is not the world that we live in because everything is compromising. As long as it's right for you, go ahead and do what is right. Now, praise the Lord, God never said that. Because at that point in time, we would all be dead and there would be no more people left. Honor is uncompromising. It makes up everything you are, and honor is actually a twofold process. I don't know if you've thought about this, but it's a twofold process. Number one, it represents a bigger picture, something that is higher than yourself. For the military, whom do they serve? They serve a nation, they serve the people. And the second is it reveals how you live and how you actually live what you believe. See, many of you have fought for our nation, have embodied this value, especially in their character, who they were, why they stood, why they fought, how they lived. Isn't that something to praise the Lord for, that there were honorable men and women who went on our, before us? But you, have you ever stopped to think about how these individuals became honorable in the first place? If you were to ask them a question, they would have said they learned it from someone else. But ultimately, it's got to come from something or someone. And here's the simple statement I'm going to give you. Honor comes from the Lord. Because it is godly. And you can't talk about honor without talking about Jesus. Because honor is his character. You can't separate the two. And men can't become honorable unless it is first given and it first shown to them, and it has to be given out of the goodness of God. And praise the Lord, he has done so. 
And God gave mankind his character when he created us in his image. Praise the Lord, God is abundant in his mercy and grace. But just in case you might think I'm a little off, let me remind you of this vital fact, and this is where everything begins. Jesus is Lord. No one else. Jesus is Lord. And if you want to start with any good thing, it has to start with who created us all, and that is our God. In Revelation chapter 7 and verses 10 through 12, here's what he has to say. Halfway through 10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus. It says, all the angels stood around the throne and the, and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on the faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, which is so be it. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, so be it. Right? Amen. Honor belongs to our God because he is exactly what he gives. S.M. Lockridge, a famous uh, uh, evangelist. He's got a funny saying, which I absolutely love. I thought it was hysterical, but ever, ever so true. He says, in the, in the case of Jesus, he always has been is. He is is. And he always will be is. What is he saying? Is is always. Right? He is the king of glory. He is the king of kings. He is the creator of the world. He is the savior of the world. He is the Son of God. He is God. He is who He is. That's the emphasis of what He is saying. Maybe we forget that honor comes, be, comes from the Lord because we forget how God defines honor, potentially. Now remember again, honor is a twofold process. It represents a bigger picture. And it reveals how you live, what you believe. Now, I want, to, I want you to understand the, the definition and the difference in the definition of honor from God's point of view to man's point of view. This is just Webster, normal dictionary. For the bigger picture, it is a good name that merits respect, who has a superior standing amongst others, who is led by a keen sense of ethical conduct, which really means integrity. All right, a good name. It's a reputation that stands out amongst others because of his integrity. But who does that honor represent? Who does it point to? You, themselves. So with that, how you live this out, it means to treat someone with special recognition, with admiration and respect, which is great. But how do you know who stands apart? What measuring scale do we actually use, and where did they actually learn what honor is, and where did they come about it, right? Because if there's no absolute truth in this world, then there can't be any honor. If there's no honor, then why do we even bother? But yet, here is God standing in the middle that says, I am who I am. I am the absolute truth. So, from God's point of view, just look at the difference in this. And this is from six different words, and there's a few more, that the Bible uses to describe honor. In the bigger picture... Honor is the abundant glory of God, which belongs to God as supreme ruler and is held in the highest esteem to the highest degree, revealing the perfect majesty of Christ, resulting in praise and worship. Is that different? Extremely so. Because we replaced the God of honor with the person of honor, and man can't sit on the throne, only God sits on the throne. So how do we actually live that out in our lives? Well, through the grace of God, he imparts his glory upon each believer, giving each child dignity and worth, clothing them in Christ's splendor, causing them to shine with his light and becoming highly honored in the service of King Jesus. That is what it means to be honorable, to be covered in the glory of God, to live for the glory of God. And being a man of honor truly means that you worship and give glory to your God, which is just simply praise and love, and that you wrap others in the glory of Christ that he gave you, which is your service in love. And if this sounds to you of anything of familiarity, it's because Jesus talked about it in the two greatest commandments. 
in Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is honor. You honor your father and you honor those around you. So from that definition, praise the Lord that people have learned that honor of serving something bigger. And especially when they understand that it is God whom they serve. Take a look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Because we're talking about honorable believers. And this is what Peter is referencing throughout his entire book. Is he speaking to believers who are dealing with trials and persecutions. And it's not only under Roman persecution, but from of their own, some of their own. But this is what he has to say. It says, coming to him, as in Jesus, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of defense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Out of those verses, who holds that special position of honor? It is Jesus. It is Jesus and it is Christ alone who holds that special position of honor because Jesus is the chosen Messiah for the Lord's people. He is fully God and fully man, which no one else can claim ever in their lifetime. He is the sacrificial lamb of God to pay the debt no man could ever pay. He was the firstborn that was resurrected that gave life to all who come to him in faith and then become resurrected after he is the mediator and the high priest for all of God's children. He is the king who sits at the right hand of God, the right hand of power who will sit on the throne and rule on earth as king. Jesus is honor, and honor is Jesus. He holds a special position unlike everyone else. So when Peter says, when Peter says, coming to him, you believer, He's not referring to your salvation. He's referring to your specific, intimate relationship that is ongoing with the King of Kings. It's a phrase that signifies your relationship is real, that you long after it, because Jesus continues to draw you. And over and over, you come to him for that intimate fellowship, for the goal of remaining in his presence forever. Isn't that the greatest promise that we have, that we had in chapter 1? Your eternal inheritance, uncorruptible. That is that holiness that we long for. And this is the personal, intimate relationship a believer has with his God. The great, joyous, personal relationship a believer has with his God. I know there are individuals who think, well, you can read your Bible, but there's, God's not really real. You don't really learn. But I will tell you what. From somebody who's been rebellious to someone who's only partially rebellious, <laughs> Anybody else struggle with the rebellion? I know there's quiet there, so I thought, yeah, we'll just listen to the pastor confess. Uh, I can tell you that life is so much more joyful with Jesus. Because that relationship is, it is real, it is genuine. You can look at problems and think, it's not really that big because my God is so much bigger. I have no idea what's happening. I don't know what to do, but I know my God does, so why am I going to stress too much about it, right? 
Well, I want you to just keep your finger there, but turn to me to John chapter 15. Jesus talks about this. He's given the lesson in verses 9 through 17, and we could read more of this, really. But he is our vine, we are the branches. It says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. How do you abide in the love of Jesus Christ? You spend time with him. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. We follow his word. And just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you, because greater love has no or, or greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things I command you, that you have one another. You abide in the love of your Father. You abide in the love of Jesus Christ. And I especially love verse 11, that your joy may be full. And you might be thinking, there are times when my joy is not full. Well, it's time to stop doing something else, and it's time to spend time with Jesus. You say, well, I've got other responsibilities, and your other responsibilities come in second, third, and even last compared to your responsibility with your Savior. And this is where we make the mistake as humans, because we have deadlines. There are things we have to do. There are things we have to get accomplished, and we forget God controls time. He makes everything happen. He fills bank accounts. He empties bank accounts. He gives you this, the, the grace to love. He gives you the words to speak, the strength to stand. It is amazing how time does not follow normal operations when God says, you will do everything I need you to do today. And you, everything gets accomplished. Your joy can be full because of your intimate relationship with Christ. See, knowing that these believers were, were facing trials, if you flip back with me to 1 Peter, Peter, knowing that his brethren are facing trials for the name of Jesus, for the kingdom of God, he is reminding them of where their joy and their strength is found, and it is found in their active relationship with Jesus. And you might think, well, they don't have their Bible. It was taken away from them. You still have your God. You might think, well, I haven't been able to memorize or sing or read because they have silenced me. You have the living spirit of God inside of you. He can't silence your relationship. It might silence the body, but they can't take away your soul. It might shut your mouth, but they can't stop the glory of God shining through you. See, Peter is using this new, al- a new analogy, this new metaphor to remind them of who Jesus is yet again. And then remind them of their holy living, their call to a holy living. So he says very clearly here in verse 4, is coming to him, that's that relationship there, as to a living stone. Jesus is the living stone. If you go back to Daniel, Jesus is a stone that is cut out of a mountain, not by human hands, that crushes every other civilization and reigns as king. He's the living stone. But it is, this has a dual meaning. And I want you to understand that there is a dual meaning because it suggests that the believers are being persecuted by both Greeks and Jews. That's the problem sometimes for us. It holds two different applications, yet refers to the same exact principle. See, the Jews, it is a reference to the Old Testament prophets in verses 6 through 8. They prophesied that God's chosen deliverer would be rejected by his own people. And that rejection would become the greatest stumbling block against them, which we still see today, sadly. It won't be that way forever, though. And Peter is clearly saying to the Jews that Jesus is greater than a temple, than a building made out of stone. Just think about that. Here we are in church, nice building. Eventually the air will be on. I would be much happier up here. 
It's cooking. But what happens if this, somebody burns our building down? Does the church stop being the church? Right? See, this is the thing. This is what Jews, they are, they are very wrapped around, very much wrapped around the temple made out of stone. The reason the temple was great in Old Testament times is because God decided to put his presence in the middle of it. It wasn't because of the stone, it was because God was there. We forget that. See, was, Jesus is greater than any man-made tradition that has been passed down from generation to generation. He's greater than any building. He's greater than any tradition. It's all about Jesus. And a building that is made out of stone cannot do anything for you. It is just a pile of rocks. But for many, it took a higher priority than God himself. But if you think about this living stone from a Gentile perspective, how did they carve their, their gods? Many of them were out of stone. And Jesus is not just a carved idol made out of stone. He is the living God. He is not the cross you wear around your neck. He is the living God. So he's telling him very clearly, put away your stone gods. Put away your belief in a stone temple and believe in the living word, the living God, the God who defeated sin and death with his death and resurrection. And now we have great life. See, Peter is saying that it is only Jesus where life is found, and it is given to all who come to him. How many of you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? See, it is Jesus who is the cornerstone of the new building of God, and the new building of God is called the church, and the church is where people are gathered together. The church is alive because Jesus is alive, and this is what Peter is talking about. Where believers are assembled, their God is also. Because who is he talking to? He's talking to believers in Asia Minor who were in Turkey. If you could only worship at the temple in Jerusalem, they would not be able to worship their God. They have the living Christ. Matthew 18 reminds us of this principle. It says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Isn't that wonderful? Church happens wherever you are. Wherever. So he's telling them, take heart, believer, for if God's chosen Messiah, your living Lord and Savior Jesus, was chosen and rejected by men, yet still holds a position of honor before God the Father, so too will you. You are God's elect. You are chosen by God. You are valued by God for his glory and for his service. You are held in a position of honor because you are covered in the splendor of your king. That is praiseworthy. This is why in verse 5, Peter refers to them as living stones. Your identity, this is what he is talking about. Though you may be in a foreign land, may or may not be home, your identity is not found in this world, it is not found where you travel. Your identity is found in your living God, the living word, your living hope. His name is Jesus Christ. That is your nature. You are given a good, holy nature of Christ. It is the righteousness of Christ. You are no longer children of wrath. And one day we won't have to struggle with the sin that is in our body. Though we are, let me remind you, you are not enslaved and under the power of it now if you are the believer, but you still battle with it. See, you're alive in God because Jesus is alive. He is resurrected from the grave, and if the world needs to see the church is actually alive, it is today. They need to see that Jesus is real because his children believe and follow genuinely. Because you come to him in an active, intimate relationship. You are so closely united with Jesus that when people see you, they see Christ. That's our goal. It is Christ who holds the preeminent position of the church. It is not your pastor. It is Christ. This is how the church has continued on because it is not the people who lead. It is Christ. It is we who follow. Just imagine... I can't, I can't remember how many pastors were here up until today. None of them had the same personality. Oh, boy. Oh. Whoa. You can't do things the same. Ah. Yet Christ is consistent and the same and continuous 
and it is Christ who holds the greatest position of honor as our King and Lord, and it is Christ who shares that glory of his Father with you and I and our relationship with him. If you want to feel joy, just remember that you are in the presence of God, for the Holy Spirit resides in you. Remember, as he says here, very much so, you as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. This is something that we as a body do not spend enough time reflecting upon. Because we are chosen as a royal priesthood that is supposed to be pleasing to God. Who is the first royal priesthood? Israel was the chosen people of God. What did they do? They did not follow what they were supposed to. Not yet, anyway. They did for a short period of time, and they did for little pieces of time, but not as a nation. You are a royal priesthood right now. And here's some special characteristics that this, this position of honor, and it is a position of honor, and it is a position of privilege that, that we, we hold at the moment. You have been chosen by God. It is a privilege to be chosen by God, and you need to keep reminding yourself it is a privilege. It's not something you and I deserved. It's because of God's grace that he chose us. You have been cleansed of your sins, not by bulls and goats, but by the blood of Christ himself. You've been clothed for service, specifically with the robe of righteousness of Christ. You've been anointed for service through the Holy Spirit of God, we are to honor and love the Word of God, the full Word of God. Yet again, before I go on a tangent, the full Word of God, Genesis to Revelation. You have been appointed to obedience in the Word of God because you love the Word of God and you crave it. You are to impact and influence the lives of sinners as messengers of God by and in His truth. What that means is I speak the truth, I live by the truth, very simply. And then you are to offer up spiritual sacrifices before the Lord, which is what verse 5 tells us. And you might think, what in the world are these spiritual sacrifices? And they're things that you do already. Here's number one, which we struggle with. We praise God in all circumstances. Well, I didn't get what I want. Tough. Praise the Lord. Endure. Persevere. Wait for him to give you something better. We can pray on behalf of others. I'll give you a testimony now. Here, Terry Usher is with us after brain surgery on Tuesday. She really almost ran out of the hospital on Friday, but she's here now <laughs> as it goes. Prayer works because God works. We can encourage the body of Christ many different ways. But it all starts with sacrificing our desires to serve others. That's that selfless service. We share our resources with the body from financial to emotional to physical. As Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us, we are to be set apart from the world. So closely united, we don't blend in with the world, we stand apart. You might think, well, that's where people hate me. And that's exactly where God wants you because they need to see the glory of God. And you are renewed each day for his service in your mind. Your mind is renewed in his truth. And all of these things together lead people to, to Jesus Christ. They are led through truth. They are led through perseverance. You might think, well, they hate me now. Great, you hated Jesus for a long time too, but he won. And he can win in them too. We're called to persevere. See, those who have come before you, those great men and women of honor, of faith who have come before us, who were chosen to proclaim the Lord God before a darkened world. This is Israel in itself. They stumbled in their calling. They stumbled. Israel was God's chosen people but were disobedient through their unbelief. They rejected the word of God time and time again. They rejected their chosen Messiah and they killed their chosen Messiah. And as a result, they have temporarily, and hold on to that word, temporarily, been removed of this privilege as God's royal priesthood until the time they are fully redeemed and they accept of their acceptance of Jesus as Messiah. And now the church has taken the special position of honor as the royal priesthood until the day that Israel is restored and we are all grafted together. 
This is the special position of honor that Peter is reminding believers in their relationship of Christ. Let me give you this reminder again, just in case you forgot. You, just as they were, have been called out of a place of darkness. You have been called out from your sin. You have been given the ministry of the light of Christ, and there is no greater privilege than speaking and living for our Lord and Savior. You might think, it doesn't really pay well. It does in some eternal blessings. It is tremendous because everything that we have is a gift from God anyway and what he gives us there will be greater than what we have now. We've attained eternal mercy from God. Even in our struggles, we have eternal mercy. We're called to proclaim the gospel of Christ, the mysteries of God, the truth of his word. What a wonderful time it is. But he's telling them, don't be like those who have gone before you, who have rejected their calling, who have rejected their priesthood, who have rejected their Messiah. You do not have to follow that same path if you love the Lord and follow his commands. But sadly, I will tell you, many in God's church today have done the very same thing. This is where we stand. They've traded in honor and righteousness of Christ for their own self-righteousness. They've traded in a merciful and holy God for one that is more accepting to a darkened world. Because now, in order to get people in church, we have to make Jesus appealing. Jesus becomes appealing when we stand before a holy God and we fear him and we remember that we are sinful as he breaks us of that sin and sets us free. See, the world doesn't need more accepting. They need more saving. They need Jesus. As Charles Spurgeon once said, he said, self-righteousness exclaims, I will not be saved in God's way. I will make a new road to heaven. I will not bow before God's grace. I will not accept the atonement which God has wrought out in the person of Jesus. I will be my own redeemer. I will enter heaven by my own strength and glorify my own merits. See, the Lord is very wroth against self-righteousness. I do not know, and I, I agree with him very much so, I do not know of anything against which his fury burneth more than against this, because this touches him in a very tender point. It insults the glory and honor of his son, Jesus Christ. See, self-righteousness removed Israel temporarily from their position of honor and privilege in the kingdom of God. Self-righteousness removes those in the church of the position of honor and privilege in the kingdom of God. Why is this such a problem for people throughout history? Because too many individuals think lightly of their sin. Therefore, too many of us think lightly of the Savior of God. Because if you don't see your sin as heavy, you don't see your God as powerful. So here's what it comes down to simply, and this is what Peter is saying. It is time for you and I to remember your honor our honor, and our honor is Christ. It is time for the church to remember their honor. Our honor is Christ alone. Let us remember the splendor of the king. He is glorious. Let us remember whose robe we are cloaked in and the perfection that lies there. Let us remember who our cornerstone of faith and mercy is, is remembering our God. Then let us live according to our calling as a royal priesthood, as a nation set apart, let us live acceptable and holy before our God because that is what he has called us to. Be holy for I am holy. Let us live as living stones in a living God for all you farmers out there. Those things which you once moved will be glorious and great. Stones will be alive. Living stones. Simply put, let us just live on as honorable children of God. Your honor matters. Your honor matters because it has everything to do with your character. And if Jesus is honor, then let us be like Jesus. There will be no greater rep reputation that can be said of any individual at a funeral, memorial service, or whatever name you want to give it, then they are an honorable man or woman in the name of Jesus Christ and people responded to the glory of God. It is all about the name of Christ. 
So as we close, make sure you keep coming to him. Make sure that the living stone is indeed your cornerstone of your life, that Jesus is your foundation. And then just start loving him through work. How do you love people? How do you love the person next to you? Through the gospel, through the generosity of Christ, through the word of God. Our God is holy and he is honorable. Heavenly Father, Father, we praise you for your nature and how you have given it to each and every believer. One of the leading characteristics of that nature is your honor that gives the glory of God to your children, that reveals who our Savior is, who our Creator is, that is sovereign God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Father, we praise you today that many men and women who have gone before us have exemplified this very simple thing. They have learned from you. They have testified of you. From the martyr to the soldier, men and women have stood before us following your footsteps testifying of something bigger, and that something bigger is you, Father. May we remember that we are wrapped in the splendor of Christ, and that we share, when we share the gospel, we wrap others in that splendor, praying that one day they will come to salvation and faith in him alone. Father, we thank you that you willingly share and welcome us into your glory, for your glory. Father, may our hearts be filled with praise and gratitude. Though there are times of sorrow, though there are times of weeping, may we never forget to praise you in all circumstances. May we never forget to love our brethren. Father, may we never forget that you can save any individual from any circumstance at any time, through the power of your word, through faith in Jesus Christ, let us be a faithful messenger of honor rather than a sinful judge of people. Father, may we live today as your church, as a royal priesthood. Just help us, Father, in our discernment and our wisdom on how to do this each and every day. But may we set apart time for you, our first priority, our love and trust you with the rest of the day. You are great and glorious, Father, and we praise you and say thank you and that we love you. And all God's people said, amen. Well, God bless. We thank you for worshiping with us today. There is some snacks out back, some fellowship to be had. You can be just as loud back there, too. It's all right. God bless and enjoy your weekend.